Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. The deep freeze has put Albertans on notice. The fear of rolling blackouts is real, as a recent massive cold front from the Northwest Territories that flooded the province and its neighbors led to concerns about its citizens' ability to keep the lights on, and the furnaces too. Alberta's utilities minister was flat out asked, if Alberta had been operating with a capacity power model instead of an energy-only model, would this crisis have been averted? Nathan Newdorf admitted it was possible. Meet Kent Phelps, a fellow in residence at the Institute and an assistant professor of economics and associate program director of the Canadian Northern Corridor Research Program at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. He joins us for insight into Alberta's current blackout issues, the nature of its energy system, and what this means for Canada's energy transition. Kent, thank you for joining us again. My pleasure. Uh, let's start by comparing and contrasting Alberta's energy model. Explain a capacity power model and how it differs from Alberta's energy only model. Sure. So I'll start by talking about the, the model that we currently have, which is the energy only market. Um, Alberta is somewhat unique. It's definitely unique in Canada as being the only market where generators, so the people who own these large coal plants or wind farms, solar generation, what have you, they get paid per megawatt hour. So they get paid for the electron, and that's the only thing they get paid for. If you're in this market and you're trying to make money, you have to generate, you have to be on grid. Um, that contrasts with other provinces that may have uh, some variation of that, or crown corporations like we see in British Columbia and Saskatchewan. Now, a capacity market, which is something Alberta doesn't have, but something that we've talked about, would be sort of layered on top of that. And it would pay these generators uh, for being on standby. It would pay them for capacity. So, so the option value, that if you can dispatch, you get an extra top up for being able to do that. So that would contrast, say, a natural gas generator that can decide when it's generating and, and when it's ramping up and when it's ramping down versus something like wind, which is intermittent. You know, wind generators are only generating when uh, the wind is blowing. Solar farms are only generating when the sun is shining. So they wouldn't get that capacity payment. So it's really this sort of second market that we set up to run alongside the energy market to give a little top up to those generators that uh, they can actually choose when they dispatch. You mentioned that neighboring provinces, BC and uh, Saskatchewan, have a very different approach to all of this. And these were the two provinces that sort of rode to the rescue of Alberta during this crisis. If Alberta is largely alone in its energy regulatory model, is it fair to say it's an inferior model for a province that routinely gets to minus 24 in the north over a winter? But I think there are definitely some trade-offs, right? And, and part of this uh, is sort of evidence of what's your overall philosophy towards market design and structure. Where, where do you come at it from? Um, one thing that the Alberta market historically has been pretty good at is allocating capital, um, because instead of being one single crown corporation that uh, the reports to administer, uh, what we have is we have an open market. And so anyone who thinks they can make money in the Alberta market can bring capital to this market and can deploy it. So when the mistakes are sort of made in Alberta, um, they're, they're mistakes of the private sector versus mistakes of the public sector. Um, whether you're comforted by that or not kind of depends on, on where you are on the political spectrum, I think. Um, but Alberta's been really, really good at, at doing things like attracting uh, renewable generation, right? We are the province in Canada that's responsible for the most of that over the last 10 years by a pretty significant margin that we've got wind and solar generators locating here, largely because of the free market. There's this narrative around that they're getting subsidies, and while that may be true for some of the older ones, the majority of, of uh, folks who are setting up here in terms of a, you know, a per dollar capital basis are coming here because there's an open market and because they can make money. So I think the theory sort of runs that uh, what you should expect in Alberta is you should expect a higher variance of, of energy prices, um, but a lower overall average. Now I say that it's also hard to do an apples to apples comparison. You know, we're right next door to British Columbia, which has a lot of hydro capacity because they have a lot of elevation differences and they've got those large rivers they can dam. Uh, and that's just a fantastic resource. Alberta doesn't have that. Um, you know, we, we have some mountains, but most of those mountains are in BC. The reservoir space is all in BC. Our rivers are pretty flat. And so, you know, we do run a river or, or smaller um, capacity uh, hydro. So it is hard to do a, a cross comparison cross province because we're all kind of starting from from different positions. You mentioned, though, that because um, this is a more uh, private sector driven environment in Alberta, 
It can take a long time, even if we greenlit tomorrow a new nuclear power plant or we brought back coal and things of that nature, to get that kind of energy online. Is, is it not sort of a repudiation of this approach when it's so difficult to encourage a private sector player to open its wallet in the first place? Yeah, there's there's definitely two sides to that. Um, you know, my colleague Andrew Leach at the University of Alberta has been pretty vocal, and, and I think he set the right uh, the right element here that what caused these recent uh, grid alerts in Alberta was really delays in planned uh, generation. So the Alberta Electric Systems Operator, the guys who are kind of responsible for for setting up the market and everything. Um, they have this interconnection queue. So it's the list of projects that are set to come online and sort of when they're set to come online so they can do things like planning for transmission and distribution. So the electric lines to actually um, hook generators up to the grid. And we've actually got quite a bit of new capacity in that queue right now, but a lot of it has been delayed recently. So I don't think it's so much a problem of attracting this capital. I think it's project delays um, that are... are generated by multiple factors that have kind of stalled this out that these these new generators should have been on grid some of them by now and have been delayed now it's easy to look at alberta's energy only market and say well it's you know you don't have central planning on it it's an open market and so you're getting these delays but other provinces are seeing this too right the site c dam um, which is a pretty visible project in, in british columbia they delayed filling that reservoir by a year recently it was supposed to fill it in in 2023 now they're filling it in 2024 the same type of, of delay. Now that hasn't caused critical issues on on uh, their grid, so fair enough. But I don't think this is just an Alberta specific project problem. I think um, Canada and, and probably broader North America um, have a problem now with large infrastructure projects and delays in those infrastructure projects because we're figuring out new ways to do these uh, things like environmental reviews and these regulatory things that are all really, really important, but they do lead to delays in construction. So I'm throwing a lot at you with that answer, but uh, I think it's really important for people to realize that um, what's happened here is it's not a failure of the Alberta market to attract capital. It's a delay in getting that capital on grid that if we had these large projects that are planned, if, if they come through with the original timelines, we would have, wouldn't have been in a, in a situation that we were in uh, with those recent grid alerts. Well, help me understand that in, in greater detail, because the province's cascade plants were expected to be online by the end of the year, but they just only recently did a test. It only added a single megawatt of electricity to the grid. As a geek, I can consume a megawatt myself just with all my toys. So what's the issue? Uh, I mean, that's a really good question. And if, if I had the answer, I'd, I'd sort of be talking to the ASO about it, letting them know uh, how we speed these things up. I mean, I think Part of it um, is governments thinking seriously about strategies for infrastructure. Um, so this isn't necessarily the same thing as, as full out planning. Um, that you know you've got a government deciding where and when things should be constructed, but coming up with a with sort of an integrated strategy. And so, um, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, I, I run our uh, Canadian Northern Corridor Research Program, which is about linear infrastructure corridors. Uh, which is a preferred model for building things like transmission capacity um, because you're able to do um, you know, siting for those things appropriately and, and you do it in a multimodal way to try to integrate highways, electricity, transmission lines. I think that's definitely one model that we could look at. Um, but I also think, you know, you, you look at the Supreme Court cases with things like the Species at Risk Act or the Environmental Assessment Act, um, and there's a lot of legal things and regulatory things that need fixing. As an economist, all I can do is show from the sidelines and say, we need to get this done because there's huge value in it. I don't know how to fix some of that stuff. Well, let me you know, sort of speak to the economist in you, because the province's energy minister says that population growth has played a role in the increased demand. But how big of a role does it play? Uh, I mean, proportionally, probably less than in other provinces, uh, to be perfectly blunt. So, I mean, you, you think that residential use is going to scale more or less linearly with population. So, I mean, if you, you know, if you increase the population by 10%, your residential use is probably going to go up by about 10%. Um, Alberta actually has a fairly large industrial load compared to other provinces that we use a lot of electricity um, on the industry side, not the residential side. So, actually, our share um, is, is skewed in that direction. We use a lot more for industrial usage than, say, British Columbia does. So it, does it play a role? Absolutely. Um, is it sort of the straw that broke the camel's back in this case? I, I don't think so. It's, it's probably a contributing factor. But here again, if the private market is working well, 
we would hope that uh, that firms that are uh, in the generation space or interested in getting into the generation space would do their own analysis of that, right? You know, if I'm an entrepreneur or I'm, a, I'm an energy company, when I see, oh, Alberta's got a population growth, they're going to need more electricity, that's a market signal to me that I want to build new generation. And in fact, as I was just saying, we have lots of firms that want to do that. You know, we've got companies that are building wind, we've got companies that are building natural gas plants in Alberta. Um, so that that uh, supply of infrastructure, that supply of capital is there. It just is coming too slowly. The NDP is calling on Daniel Smith's government to enable utilities to own and operate storage facilities. Is that a reasonable solution? It, storage is interesting. I, it solves a problem um, that the grid has, but uh, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. When you look at where uh, energy storage, electricity storage has been um, economically successful, it's not dealing with this sort of long-term arbitrage. So, I mean, you're not you're not filling it one hour and then waiting ten hours and discharging it. What what energy storage is really really good for is it's good for alleviating what we call the the ramping con- restraint or the ramping constraint. And this is the time it takes something like a natural gas plant or older style a coal plant to ramp up generation. Um, these things do not flick on and off like your light switch, which is part of the problem. Uh, it takes time to ramp ramp up a, a large natural gas generator, depending on the technology. Um, and so it's that sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes to get those up to speed. That's where you run into real problems. Um, and you can sort of see it that uh, one of the issues with having more solar on grid is solar appears on grid really, really quickly and then disappears on grid really, really quickly as the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And so if you're trying to balance in sort of those 15 minute increments when the sun is coming up and then again when the sun goes down, you need sort of a shock absorber. And I think that's where energy storage is likely to play the best role economically. Um, so in the grid alerts that we had um, in Alberta recently, I don't think storage would have helped that much um, because it's really, that's not the market case for it. At least that hasn't been the market case that we've seen being successful. It is the province sort of taking this head on, like when, when the the, uh, the concerns about rolling blackouts hit, of course, I'm on social media and people are pointing out, wait a minute, you want me to cut back on my home energy consumption, but I just drove past a stadium, all the lights are on, the LED billboards are up and running with advertisements. There seems to be a disconnect between what you're asking the public to do and what you're asking the private sector to do. Yeah, I mean, so that's an interesting one. Um, when you think about the private sector, so, so, the worst uh, alert that uh, that we had recently, so we had that that space of sort of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday in Alberta, and on the Saturday night, uh, the province actually used the emergency alert system, so everyone got an emergency alert on their cell phone, same as if you were you know in a province where you had an amber alert or something for for uh, for for one of those cases, um, and that's pretty alarming development. Before they get to that stage. Um, the systems operator would go around to those large industrial consumers that I was talking about, and they would get them to curtail first because it's it's easier. Those firms tend to be price responsive anyways because they're in large cases they're they're exposed to the wholesale price. Residential consumers aren't. I pay the same price on my own electricity use regardless of the time of day, and so a lot of that stuff would have been shut off. Now where you're where you're missing things is stuff like small businesses or potentially government buildings. Um, where there are you know, regular operating procedures and, and you know they don't turn off lights. I, I was on social media as well, people pointing out that I think the uh, the uh, legislature still had lights on when they were asking residential consumers to turn theirs off. Um, that's not good optics. Uh, that is a problem, and I think the the government probably needs to look into that before they try this again or or before we hopefully we never end up in a crisis like that again. But certainly before we do, I think they need to look into that. Um, on a, on a megawatt hour basis or on a megawatt basis of load, I, I don't want to overplay how important that generation is. You know, it, it's easy to kick sand at the, at the province for leaving the lights on at the legislature. But if you compare that to, you know, a couple thousand people unplugging their Christmas lights, um, probably the, the residential reduction in load is, is considerably more just because of that multiplier effect. So... Uh, I think given the circumstances and given how close we we came um, to actually having to have rolling brownouts in the province, uh, I think everything was handled reasonably well. But as I said, I think there's definitely an optics issue that, uh, you know, if you're a business or you're in government, 
Uh, you need a plan so that the next time this happens, you're shutting down your your usage to the extent that you can as well, um, just to be a good Alberta citizen, to be a good corporate citizen, or, or to be a good public citizen. So as provinces like Ontario flip energy assets like transmission lines into private hands, Alberta is being urged to create a crown corporation, create a publicly owned utility. Is that even an option politically? Uh, I think it might be. Uh, you know, this is a case where never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, you've got a lot of Albertans that are very upset about this. Um, it, it is amazing how well the emergency alert works. But all the research that we've seen is, is that you can't rely on that as a long-term solution, right? And so um, Alberta has this reputation as being uh, right-wing and, and free market. And in some cases, it's really well-earned. But in other cases... You know, people want the services to which they feel they are entitled. And so I don't think there's a large percentage chance of that happening, um, but I'd be surprised if it wasn't seriously on the table and, and being uh, discussed. I personally am not sure that it, it's a great idea, but like I said, it, I, I think at this stage, because of how close we came, um, all options are probably on the table if you're sitting in the minister's office. What about the option of small modular nuclear reactors? You know, they're capable of being delivered to a community on the back of a tractor trailer. Can they play a role in filling in the gap? I think so. Uh, and, and, and what's even more interesting with that, again, because of the open market design here, if a small modular reactor can make a go of it economically in Alberta, that's a great signal to these ground corporations that maybe this technology makes sense uh, at a grid scale, you know, plopping some of those down. We hear a lot about sort of niche use cases of small modular reactors. There are people talking about them um, for uh, northern grids that are, are maybe less connected to the to the national grid. In some cases, uh, strangely, they're actually oversized for some of those, even though we call them small modular reactors. You're probably thinking more of, of a technology called micro modular reactors, which are the same thing, but even smaller. Um, so I, I think they definitely could play a role. I know there's lots of interest in Alberta in nuclear. And like I said, if they can make a go of it here with the open market design where it's sort of, you know, throw them in the water and see if they swim, uh, I think that's a really good signal to other grid operators that, that these things do make sense. I sort of touched on the idea that it's difficult to convince um, a private player to open its wallet when it knows it can take forever to build a, a traditional plant, nuclear, coal, gas, what have you. Uh, but, you know, even SMRs, uh, take time to build compared to a traditional nuclear power plant. It's less, but you know Ontario isn't expecting SMRs to be operational for another four to five years, and so it would be even longer for Alberta if it could take possession of any of the units built by Ontario Power Generation. So what's the solution between now and then? So I think there's a, a couple of things to look at, and there are a few things that we could do pretty quickly in Alberta that I think would help. So, I mean, the first thing is we have this new natural gas generation set to come online, uh, a couple of plants uh, with, with quite uh, high nameplate capacities. And I think once they're online, that takes care of most of this in the, in the near future. Um, and so I think it's more about how do you how do you change the regulatory structure to make sure we don't end up in this situation again in a couple of years uh, as demand grows and things like that. Um, one thing that I think the province should seriously be looking at is a combination of policies around interprovincial interties uh, and our wholesale price cap. So right now we have interties with British Columbia grid, the Saskatchewan grid, and into Montana, but they're pretty small. Um, and in particular, the BC Alberta tie line has been downgraded on its capacity in recent years. Um, as for system stability issues for basically for risk management. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you've got huge inflows from BC, then the tie line goes down and you have to replace all that with domestic generation all at once. And so they're careful about how much the, there's the physical capacity and the regulated capacity. Right now, the regulated capacity is much lower. Some of these new generators uh, hopefully help that uh, with some contingency reserve and a few things like that. But I think longer term, looking more into how we can uh, expand those interties and rely on them a little bit more really helps minimize system costs. So oversimplifying a bit, but not too much. It makes an awful lot of sense for Alberta to have that Alberta BC intertie because we can be feeding them electricity when we've got strong wind generation and then we can buy it back when we don't because they can use that electricity to keep the water behind their reservoirs and then run it through when we're at, in a, a short situation on electricity. And Alberta's got fantastic wind reserves, some of the best in the country. So as we look to more capitalize on that, we'll end up with excess supply 
uh, there that we can then be selling to them when the wind is blowing. When the wind is not blowing, we can buy it back. Now, I mentioned off the top that uh, I think that has to be paired with this really serious look at where our, our wholesale price cap is. Right now in Alberta, the maximum price uh, for wholesale electricity is uh, $1,000 a megawatt hour. Actually, technically it's $999.99 a megawatt hour. But, um, and, and that actually does limit us on being able to purchase electricity at times because if I'm sitting in British Columbia's BC Hydro, there are periods at which Alberta is at its wholesale price cap, but I can actually get more per megawatt hour if I sell into Washington, into the Seattle spot price. Uh, and I think that's an issue for Alberta, something we need to look at, that if we want to be competitive on the demand side, we might have to think seriously about changing that um, that price cap. Now, we'll have Alberta consumers that were sort of balk at that, that, okay, you want to increase the wholesale price cap, does that mean I'm going to be paying more for electricity? Not necessarily, because that gives us the freedom to buy when we're in those short situations instead of having to build more generation ourselves. And so this is a really complex market. So I think these are things that we can look at uh, in the very short term. I also think that there's probably some more room to investigate um, demand side responses, uh, potentially through price sensitivity rather than through sending everyone an emergency alert to you know turn off all your lights. Um, there are some consumers that I think would be fine with that. Other consumers might not be, and, and we can capitalize on the ones that are and, and say, okay, that's fine for the ones that aren't. You've mentioned wind several times. Renewable energy, uh, not just exclusively in Alberta, but generally speaking, is is often sort of at the center of political culture war talk. Um, as Canada on the whole tries to move away from uh, the, the types of energy that has a high carbon footprint, the one that has a low or none, uh, what are your thoughts on how we accomplish that in light of the way that renewables often get batted about uh, in the political arena? Like the best way to think about this is to think about your generation mix in any province or, or nationwide as a portfolio. The same as you balance you know, a stock portfolio or a portfolio of, of anything else, any types of assets. Um, wind and solar have some attributes that are really fantastic and some attributes that aren't so great. Natural gas have some attributes that are really fantastic and some attributes that aren't so great. So like wind and solar have very low marginal cost of generation, basically $0 per megawatt hour. So once you have the upfront capital cost, you're generating for free. So as long as you think you're going to get enough revenue to pay off those upfront costs, it makes a lot of sense. They're also zero carbon, um, at least on the, on the generation side of things, and that makes them really attractive. But they have this intermittency problem that you can't count on them to be there, um, particularly during cold snaps like we had in Alberta. You can try to pair that with storage, or you can try to pair that with natural gas. But uh, I think too many people try to set it up as a horse race where it's one technology or another and which one's going to win. And I don't see it as as uh, natural gas versus wind being a productive conversation. I think it's balancing natural gas and wind how much of each. Um, so that's the first place I'd, I'd start looking at it. And then trying to communicate that to people honestly, that um, you, you get very fair criticisms. People say, well, I mean, we can't rely on wind because the wind isn't always blowing. We can't rely on solar because the sun isn't always shining. And that's true. And in Alberta, I don't think you're going to find anyone investing in a wind farm that thinks they're going to be generating at or near nameplate capacity 100% of the time. They know they're not. That's baked in to the investment decision. Um, and, and so far, aside from, from the recent uh, grid alerts, the free market here has actually delivered that pretty well. Um, provinces that have planned grids have delivered that pretty well. Uh, so so you've got a lot of that pushed into it. And then I'll, one more element of that that I think is really important is, again, going back to this idea that different provinces have different natural endowments, right? Um, Alberta has historically had a much more emissions-intensive grid because we don't have the... Uh, the um, hydro resources that a place like British Columbia or Manitoba has, and we do have lots and lots of cheap natural gas, um, particularly if you don't have to pay to pipe it out of the province, you know, the, the spot price in Alberta, it's pretty attractive, uh, makes natural gas very attractive compared to other generation technologies. And so it's sort of trying to balance that um, is, I think, the right way to think about it. And that's also why I think interties uh, should be playing a larger role here because they give us a bigger portfolio. Anyone who's done portfolio management knows the bigger your portfolio, the easier it is to diversify it. So again, anytime that comes up, I just encourage people to think about this as a portfolio standard. Think about it as a portfolio approach. 
what is the set of assets, what what complementary technologies do you want in your portfolio? So that's a, a measured and detailed response to the issues that we've talked about over the course of our time together. But if you found yourself in an elevator with Danielle Smith and you had 30 seconds, what would you say to her? Uh, I'd say the energy only market in Alberta has done a pretty good job of, of supplying what it needs to supply. What we need to do is look at some of the details on how do we get over some of this red tape on the regulatory side of things? Uh, how do we help these investment companies uh, overcome limitations so they can get on grid faster? Uh, and how do we just make sure that, that we can keep the market that we have stable? I don't think it's a productive use of time to try to blow that up or relitigate a lot of this stuff. Um, also, I, I would implore the Premier to get rid of this moratorium that uh, they put on renewable investment because I think that sends exactly the wrong signal to potential investors in grid. We have a well-earned decade-long uh, history of being an open market that has done really well at attracting private capital. We need we need to continue to focus on that. I think that was more than 30 seconds, but uh, there you go. <laughs> We're at our floor. Kent, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Always a pleasure. Kent Fellows is a fellow in residence at the C.D. Howe Institute and an assistant professor of economics and associate program director of the Canadian Northern Corridor Research Program at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.